And much more, including an interview with the family of the six-year-old Palestinian boy who was killed as rhetoric around the war between Israel and Hamas escalated. Plus, he's been lobbying for the top job as Speaker of the House, but his allegations from when he helped lead a college wrestling team that could endanger Jim Jordan's prospects further. We'll speak to former Ohio State wrestlers who say Jordan betrayed them and should not be Speaker coming up. And how do Israeli forces root out Hamas and save those being held hostage? We'll speak to one expert on underground warfare about that treacherous mission. And that is where we begin our program with a shocking blast at a hospital in Gaza City. Palestinian officials say hundreds are dead. Tonight, Palestinians are blaming Israel, while Israel insists it was an errant rocket fired by the, quote, Islamic Jihad. The incident, which has left at least 500 people dead, according to the Gaza Health Ministry, is already having a major diplomatic impact. President Biden on his way to Israel tonight, but the Palestinian Authority president pulled out of the planned summit in Jordan after the blast. And late today, we got word from the White House the entire summit in Jordan Jordan will no longer take place. Thousands of Palestinians had taken shelter at the hospital on the hospital grounds, fleeing their homes in northern Gaza after Israel warned them to evacuate. What about a looming ground invasion? After the expectation the invasion was imminent, an IDF official now says they, quote, may do something different. Our Matt Gutman spent the day with Israeli forces training for close contact if and when they go into Gaza's urban terrain. And tonight, more than 100 trucks are waiting in Egypt, full of aid for the Gazans in need. That border, however, remains closed, and it's unclear when the aid will be allowed in. So what comes next, and what impact will an incredibly high-stakes trip to Israel by President Biden have on the entire process? Our team in the region is standing by. We begin with our chief global affairs anchor, Martha Raddatz, in Tel Aviv. Tonight, the death toll rising in the devastating strike on a hospital in Gaza City. Palestinian officials saying at least 500 people killed in what they claim was an Israeli airstrike. Video circulating online showing the carnage, fires raging in the rubble. First responders rushing victims away. The hospital was already packed with the wounded, as well as thousands of Palestinians seeking shelter from the fighting. Israel tonight adamant they were not at fault. This was the Islamic Jihad that fired a long-range rocket towards a, a long-range target. It failed and exploded, and that is what happened at the hospital. A U.S. official telling ABC it is uncertain who launched the strike and it will take a while to determine. The catastrophic blast triggering major protests in the West Bank and neighboring Jordan. Just as President Biden is set to begin a high-stakes trip to Israel as a show of solidarity. After Hamas massacred more than 1,400 people in Israel, the worst terror attack in the country's history. And late today, meetings with King Abdullah of Jordan and Egypt's president postponed as well. The Secret Service says it has an immensely intricate security plan in place to protect the president in what is an active war zone. Security teams already here. Trips like this one usually done in secret, but this one out in the open. As Israel prepares for a possible ground invasion in Gaza, Biden is set to meet with Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu, urging him to consider the consequences of a massive assault and the humanitarian crisis it has already caused. With airstrikes occurring throughout the Gaza Strip, residents have no place to escape. Where are we supposed to go? We went to schools, they bombed schools. We went to the south, they bombed the south. More than a million Palestinians have been displaced in Gaza, and tonight, back at that devastating scene of the hospital blast, many wondering what could possibly come next. Such disturbing scenes in Gaza. Martha Raddatz joins us now from Tel Aviv. Martha, what more are you learning about the effort by U.S. officials to determine who's behind that horrific hospital bombing? Lindsay, they'll look at whatever imagery is available. The Israelis have drones all over overhead in Gaza, and that really could help them figure out where the launch point was. But again, that could take a while. But President Biden is going ahead with this trip as he departed, putting out a statement offering his deepest condolences for the innocent lives lost in the hospital explosion. Lindsay? Martha Raddatz reporting once again from Tel Aviv in Israel. Martha, thank you.
Tonight, one topic that is sure to come up on that high-stakes visit by President Biden, the hostages in Gaza. Hamas now claims to have up to 250. Are they considering releasing any? Our chief national correspondent, Matt Gutman, reports from Tel Aviv. Tonight, as the war in Gaza intensifies, the families of the 199 hostages watching it all unfold. Increasingly fearful for their captured loved ones. Until yesterday, I didn't know if she's dead or alive. Karen Shem's daughter, Mia, disappeared at that music festival in the desert. Hamas now releasing this undated video. Mia injured, but alive. To my parents, to my brothers, she says, please get us out of here as soon as possible. I just saw my baby and I started screaming. Karen elated to see her daughter alive, but gutted by her suffering. She went through operation alone, without nobody to hold her hand, in, with terrorists around her. I mean, this is the worst nightmare every mother can have. Mia's brother, Eli, watched that video too. You know her. When you saw her eyes, what did you see? Miserable. I thought she is a very big pain. So many families watching and waiting, like the parents of 23-year-old Hirsch Goldberg Pollen. Rachel and John, originally from Chicago, telling David their son was put in the back of a pickup truck at that music festival. They showed his last two text messages saying, I love you and I'm sorry. They know he understood the pain they would experience. A week later, Rachel describing the excruciating wait. I try to go through the many, uh, you know, texts or um, emails that we're getting. And I say, I'm going to go do my cry now. And I, I go into my room and I do my, you know, primal mother. And then I wipe my face and I say, and now I have to go fight. Israel has so far tallied 199 hostages, but there are still 300 Israelis unaccounted for after Hamas's rampage. In Tel Aviv, those families rallying outside Israel's military headquarters. These posters say, bring our Idan back. And this one says, we want answers. The Israeli military tells us its special operations units are already operating inside Gaza, looking for the missing, carrying out raids, recovering some bodies, but no living hostages. Those urban areas treacherous. Today, we saw how those very troops are training. These are elite Israeli troops who are training at this base. Some of tens of thousands who've come through here to try to practice the kind of skills they're going to need inside Gaza, where the fighting will be extremely up close, room by room, floor by floor. Back at home, those families waiting for word, clinging to hope their loved ones will still return. Yeah, clinging to hope, and we see all of those kidnap posters lined up behind you. Uh, Matt Gutman joins us now once again from Tel Aviv. Matt, what's the latest on the diplomatic front to try to get these hostages back? The government of Israel, Lindsay, has been absolutely silent about what efforts it may or may not be conducting to try to get those hostages back. But the group of families representing the hostages has enlisted high-level former Israeli officials to back channel, I'm told, with contacts in Gaza. That, as a senior U.S. official is telling us that Hamas may be considering releasing women and children who are not Israeli. Unclear how many of those there are. What is becoming clear, according to that U.S. official, is that the majority of those hostages hostages are being held in Hamas's tunnels beneath Gaza. Lindsay. Mm. All right, Matt Gutman, our thanks to you. As civilians are urged to leave Gaza, Israel says it's beginning to strike parts of a secret tunnel system built under the Strip by Hamas. To understand more about this type of warfare, we welcome Dr. Daphne Richmond Barak, associate professor at Reichman University. She's also an adjunct scholar at the Modern War Institute at West Point. Daphne, thank you so much for joining us. Uh, can you first explain to our viewers why Hamas initially built this underground tunnel system? Sure. Um, Hamas is a terrorist organization that has chosen deliberately to build its entire military infrastructure underground, beneath a city, uh, beneath many several cities where civilians live and civilian homes are built and schools and mosques uh, are built. And within this underground infrastructure, Hamas houses everything that you would expect a military to, uh, to have, weapons, command and control centers, rocket launchers, its military leaders um, are also 
uh, for the most part, spending their time underground. You know, the other side doesn't have this kind of knowledge or capability, and therefore they are at a disadvantage. And you talk about those disadvantages, and I imagine that that is further complicated by the potential presence for hostages in these tunnel systems. Absolutely. Look, it's always very, very difficult to contend with subterranean threats. So the main issue that Israel faces is actually not the hostages. It's the combination of this urban terrain and this subterranean, um, you know, the subterranean network that uh, Hamas relies on to carry out any of its military actions against Israel, whether it is ro launching rockets or planning operation or even infiltrations when it uses the cross-border tunnels between uh, the Gaza Strip and Israeli territory. It would be expected that Hamas should take them out, but if, if it, Israel has to do it, then it will have to send soldiers inside the tunnels at great risk in order to, um, to do that and without any guarantee of success. How was Hamas able to construct something so expansive? It's a work in progress. It's not something that was dug yesterday. We're talking about almost two decades of, um, of experience, of um, gaining know-how and knowledge into this um, tactic of war, uh, which Hamas has perfected. But it hasn't perfected it alone. It has also gained a lot from the experience in the Syrian war and from the experience of ISIS. We heard from someone uh, from the IDF yesterday who talked about how it's simply a matter of finding the entrance and, and exit and they can just kind of shut it off so that they're, they're basically trapped underground. Would that be problematic or, or they really could, could live underground for weeks? Look, um, it, it, one, uh, what you're describing is one way to neutralize tunnels, right? To block the, up, uh, the entrance or the exit, which it can be both. But this is not really a long-term solution for tunnels. In order to fully and completely eliminate tunnels, you need to use water to collapse the tunnels, or you need to use aerial strikes. But yes, they're definitely living inside this network, the, the leaders of, of Hamas. Why? Because they know that the minute they pop out of the ground, Israel is able to identify their, their location, uh, their whereabouts. And so the whole idea is to prevent that. What, if any, criticism has Hamas faced from the people of Gaza when it comes to the construction of these tunnels? This is an excellent question. A few years ago, there was a brilliant piece in the New York Times which exposed, um, which actually spoke about the fear that Gazans, the population in Gaza, experienced. And it was absolutely mind-blowing, the fear that comes with the construction of these tunnels under their homes, which oftentimes they cannot prevent. And then the knowledge that once Israel discovers these tunnels, there will be anti-tunnel strikes or measures that are taken and that their homes will be destroyed. But what was most poignant about this piece was that when you read the testimonies of Gazans talking about the tunnel threats, it sounded like you were hearing about Israeli nationals and how they worry about the tunnel threat. And so what is really unique, what you're, you're basically putting the finger on one very unique feature of tunnels when they are cross-border, right, but also when they are under the population of, a, of, of Gaza. And it is that they really are a major threat to civilians on both sides of the conflict. So helpful to hear all of your knowledge about this. Dr. Daphne Richmond Barak, we really appreciate you coming on the show. Thank you. While we continue to follow the developments in the Middle East, the tensions right here at home are also on the rise. One of the most extreme incidents is the killing of a six-year-old little Palestinian boy in a Chicago suburb by a U.S. Air Force veteran who is charged with two counts of committing a hate crime, among other charges. The attack came amid an increase in anti-Semitic and Islamophobic incidents across the country since Hamas went on a killing rampage in Israel on October 7th. The stabbing incident also prompted a war Warning from the FBI director that the violence erupting in Israel and Gaza could spill over into the United States as more domestic lone actors seek to spread anti-Semitic or Islamophobic hate. Joining us now is Yusuf Hannan, the uncle of Wadi Al-Fayyum, that innocent child stabbed to death and whose mother is still recovering after being stabbed a dozen times. Uh, Yusuf, first off, I, I just have to thank you so much for coming onto the show during this time. Uh, 
our condolences and, and thoughts and prayers certainly are with uh, you and your family at this time. Uh, would just like to, to ask, uh, how is his mother doing at this time? Actually, for, for the mother, there, is, there isn't any uh, official information right now. Um, there is uh, the last thing we hear that she was in a critical condition. Um, uh, they, the father, you know, and other family members, they tried to reach the hospital yesterday and the day before, and we couldn't have any information, and they said that their uh, visit is not allowed. Uh, did you know this landlord who allegedly attacked them? Me personally, no, I, I didn't know him. Uh, I uh, uh, I didn't met him, but, but you know, like, uh, I wish that the father could make it us uh, to talk with us. You know, he, he, knows, he knows him very well. He was shocked, the father, you know, to hear the news about it. Because, you know, the way the landlord was acting with Uday before was, uh, I'm sorry, with, with Wadiya, was like a grandson to him. You know, he was bringing him gifts. He he, he loved him. He, 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 you know, two weeks ago when, when uh, Wadiya had his, his, his birthday, he, he brought him gifts. He brought him a, a soccer ball, you know, and uh, and in fact, you know, in the back of the house, they he he did this, a swimming pool for him. Mm. So this was, I, I, I mean, nobody could expect it that, you know. So and he had never this shown is, this any. Is, he had never shown any sort of anti-Muslim sentiment. Never, 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 never. You know, until this accident happened. Uh, there was no other sign. Um, I, I would like to ask, do you feel like your community and your houses of worship are getting the, the support from law enforcement that you need, in particular at this time? I believe uh, we need more, more, more attention, more security. And uh, uh, before this, we are a peaceful community around here. And that is how, how we are known. But the most important thing, you know, Security would do nothing if we did not change the stereotype talking against Arabs and Muslims. No, no one should feel insecure, you know, especially a, a child like Wadiya, six years old, you know, uh, uh, was killed in, 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 in the hands of a man he was, he, he loved. I'm sh I, you know, I, I, nobody was there, you know, but according to the father, you know, yesterday he was uh, crying, saying, He's sure that when, when, when the man showed up in the house, Wadiya ran to him to hug him. Instead mm. of that, he was he was met with, with a knife. 26 steps. What is this happening? And before we let you go, how would you like us to remember uh, your nephew, Wadiya? A happy boy. Uh, uh, he's open to life. He loved his, his, his soccer ball. He, 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 he loved his toys. He loved his school. He was happy, you know, learning. He was, he loved his mom. He's a smiling child. He, he, he was facing the life with, with a very big smile, you know, and uh, um, he was a happy boy. That's how we should, yesterday, I, I couldn't look at his face in the coffin. I want to keep the happy voice, mm -hmm. the, happy, the happy picture for him, the life picture. I want to keep him that way. That's why I didn't want to look at him yesterday. I can understand that. And again, uh, we certainly send our, our condolences and, and we thank you again for, for talking with us, Yusuf Hannon. I uh, really appreciate You're it. Welcome. You're welcome. Thank you very much. An urgent manhunt is now underway for four inmates who escaped a Georgia jail. The inmates face charges ranging from aggravated assault, drug trafficking to murder. The prisoners fled through a broken window in the day room of the Bibb County Correction Center and went through a cut fence. The Bibb County Sheriff's Office says a blue Dodger Chall Dodge Challenger pulled up and helped the inmates get away. The Southeast Regional Fugitive Task Force, the FBI and the U.S. Marshal's Office have all joined forces to try to find them. We turn now to Capitol Hill, where there is still no leader in the House after Republicans blocked conservative firebrand Jim Jordan's bid to become the next speaker, at least for now. Jordan could only afford to lose four Republicans, but he lost 20 in the final vote. Jordan is the founder of the far-right Freedom Caucus and is a staunch ally of former President Trump, defending his claims that he won the 2020 election. Here's Jordan on the House floor on January 6th, raising doubts about the election. Americans instinctively know there was something wrong with this election. 
80 million Americans, 80 million of our fellow citizens, Republicans and Democrats have doubts about this election. And 60 million people, 60 million Americans think it was stolen. But Democrats say no problem, no worries, everything's fine. Rachel Scott joins us now from Capitol Hill. Rachel, Jordan's refusal to acknowledge the results of the election really seems to be having an impact in this vote. Explain what you're hearing from some Republicans. Yes, it appears this did cost him votes. So I did talk to Colorado Congressman Ken Buck today. He told me that behind closed doors, he tried to get assurances from Congressman Jim Jordan that he believed that Donald Trump lost the 2020 election. But Jordan would never admit that privately behind closed doors or even publicly. We asked him again today and he did not answer our question. And so Buck told me that for that reason, along with some others, he cannot support Congressman Jim Jordan for Speaker of the House. And he said that's not changing. So Jordan didn't have the votes today. What happens next? Can he get enough support or are we back at square one? I can tell you tonight he's going to be working the phones. He's going to be trying to meet with some of those holdouts. He's even reaching out to other Republicans to help him rally support. But the reality is the more time that passes, the more Republicans he could lose because some Republicans said that they would only support him on the very first round. So we will see how this all goes down tomorrow. The next vote is tomorrow at 11 a.m., Lindsay. Right, we'll be watching. Rachel Scott, we know you will be, too. Thanks so much. Congressman Jim Jordan's handling of the January 6th insurrection isn't the only issue that could impact his candidacy for speaker. Former wrestlers from Ohio State University, where Jordan was once the assistant coach, are now speaking out about Jordan's time there, accusing the congressman of failing to protect them from a sexual predator back in the 80s and 90s. One of those former wrestlers, who was also an attorney representing some of the sexual assault victims from Ohio State, Rocky Ratliff, joins us now. Uh, Rocky, thank you so much for coming on. Uh, to be clear, the abuse allegations of these former wrestlers is against the former team doctor who was on staff at the university, but you're alleging that Jim Jordan, who was an assistant coach at the time, turned a blind eye to these alleged assaults here. Uh, tell us why. Uh, we believe uh, very strongly, uh, especially all the wrestlers that were there at the time, uh, that Jim Jordan knew what was going on. He was the head assistant coach of the wrestling program. Uh, and Jim, as well as our head coach, Russ Ellickson, and the administration at OSU uh, definitely turned a blind eye to what was happening. Uh, the abuse, not only from the doctor, but uh, everybody involved in the showers and sauna area of Larkins Hall at that time. Why do you feel so strongly that, that he knew? Um, uh, you know, the accounts of wrestlers who actually told him uh, the... Um, the number of guys that would joke and laugh about it because that's the way they dealt with it. Uh, the fact that um, the doctor was around us in our in our saunas, in our showers, uh, changing with everyone. Uh, you would have you would have to know about what is going on. Everybody knew what was going on there at that point in time. The Speaker of the House would obviously put him second in the succession to becoming President of the United States. Is it your position that Congressman Jordan's alleged failure to take responsibility regarding the alleged assaults is evidence he's not suited for that position? Uh, I think the wrestlers that I represent, not one of us would back him for such a leadership position, seeing how uh, he has abandoned us in our time of need. Uh, so I think the sentiment among the wrestling community right now that is locked in this litigation is that uh, he's just not fit for the leadership position that he desires. Uh, he's abandoned us for his own selfish reasons. Uh, when he could have helped us, uh, he's chosen not to. Uh, so that is not the good makings of any type of leadership uh, or any type of leader that he would have put up with at Ohio State. That is just not, uh, none of us wrestlers believe he should get that position. Do you think Jordan should even be a member of Congress if he knew but failed to acknowledge knowing about this abuse? Um, that That's not for us necessarily to decide. However, uh, I think Jimmy, uh, Coach Jordan, uh, Representative Jordan should come forward and, and tell the truth about what happened. At least meet with the guys. He's failed to do that, to hear our side. He's failed. You know, if even if you believe what Jim Jordan says, he has never once reached out to any wrestler to say, hey, I missed it, I'm sorry, how are you feeling? Uh, what we have from Congressman Jordan is him 
uh, engaging a PR or press firm to go out and cover up everything and say he didn't know and get wrestlers on on his side to say he didn't know. So in, in actuality, uh, Mr. Jordan has tried to discredit uh, survivors, sexual abuse survivors and what happened at Ohio State. You remain part of a lawsuit against OSU over these abuse claims. Is your goal to have Congressman Jordan testify under oath in that case to get his sworn testimony as to what he did or did not know? Yeah, in due course, uh, we fully expect uh, to subpoena, uh, use the court subpoena power to put him under oath on what he knows and what we believe he knows as to Ohio State's concealment and cover up of the sexual abuse of our team doctor. And we believe that uh, Jim Jordan is a valuable piece of that evidence and, and we await the day to put him under oath so he can answer these questions. So if he doesn't want to do it with us and come out and be clean about what's going on, I guess we will use the court subpoena power to make him. What do you say to critics, though, who would say that raising this issue now is just a partisan hit job against Congressman Jordan as he vies for a top leadership position? Um, you know, I don't think that sexual abuse and sexual assault has a party. I don't believe it's partisan in any way, shape, or form. Uh, for them to say that is just plainly, I mean, it's plain that they're just covering up his uh, his knowledge of the abuse uh, because this, this issue has more than just partisan ties. It is an American uh, problem that we need to address. So those that don't want to address it are obviously complicit with sexual abusers and molesters in our society. Uh, that's a whole nother issue. Uh, it's, it's, you know, shocking to us that they would stoop to say that this is somehow a partisan issue. We do not want to be here. Let's, let's make that completely clear. We don't want to be here. We don't want to be talking about our former coach. We don't want to be talking about how we were sexually molested or assaulted at the Ohio State University, but that's where we are. Uh, we need the truth to come out. We need to protect, uh, current students as well as future students. We need to bring the issue of uh, male sexual abuse to the forefront. Society's not willing to deal with male sexual abuse. We've seen that over and over in Boy Scouts of America and uh, the Catholic Church. We need this issue to be addressed. And if it, it if it has to be us that is the one that's going to come out and fight, why not a bunch of wrestlers? Rocky Ratliff, we so appreciate your time, appreciate your insight as well. We should note that Ohio State has admitted that it failed to protect students from Dr. Strauss, paying out $60 million in settlements to some 296 victims. We did reach out to Congressman Jordan's office for a statement, and they replied that, quote, Chairman Jordan never saw or heard of any abuse, and if he had, he would have dealt with it. So much more to get to here on Prime tonight. Coming up, a retired police officer killed while riding his bike in an alleged intentional hit and run. Our exclusive conversation with the victim's family. But next in our Prime focus, inside the major new offensive Russia is waging on Ukraine and how Ukrainian soldiers are staying vigilant and fighting back. It's going to be a long and difficult war, and for this we need to be prepared. It will not be a day or two. Це, скоріше за все, буде війна на виснаження. Whenever news breaks. The crush of families here in Poland. Here in Kentucky, no match for the tornado. From Monterey Park, California, on the ground in Ukraine. Reporting from Uvalde, Texas. NBC News Live is right there everywhere. From the scene of that deadly missile strike in Dnipro, Ukraine. Reporting from the earthquake in Turkey. From Charleston, South Carolina, on the 2024 campaign trail. From Kathmandu, Nepal. In Truckee, California, covering record snowfall. Traveling with the president in Mexico City. Wherever the story. Here at this airport in Tampa, it's already shut down. Reporting from the nurses on the picket line. Reporting from Jerusalem. Here at 10 Downing Street in London. Streaming live to you. Wherever the story is. Wherever the story is. Wherever the story is. We're going to take you there. You're streaming ABC News Live. ABC News Live. You're streaming ABC News Live. ABC News Live. Streaming free everywhere. America's number one streaming news. 
first thing in the morning. There's a lot going on. Everybody in that home is okay. To catch you up with what happened overnight. We are here at fashion's biggest night out. What's happening today, YouTube has unveiled a new set of policies. What people are talking about, the new ad campaign. Fast, straightforward. With some fun in between. A real life Barbie dream house. A name change for the Wiener Mobile. First thing in the morning. America This Morning. America's number one early morning news. On ABC News Live. All right, here we go. You ready? Let's do it. Yes, it's the show America wants and America needs right now. This is What Would You Do? Let's go. How are you? Can I hug you? Yes. So what will you be watching Saturdays on ABC News Live? What would you do? Hey, I guess I just found out. <laughs> the What Would You Do Marathon, 2 to 6 Eastern, every Saturday on ABC News Live. My favorite show. Welcome back. With the world's eyes fixed on Israel, Gaza, and Hezbollah in the north, Russia is waging a major new offensive in eastern Ukraine on a scale not seen since last winter. Thousands of Russian troops are being thrown into a massive assault, and the scale of the offensive suggests Russia is now seeking to shift the tide of war back in its favor after months on the defensive. That all comes as Ukraine, for the first time, used U.S.-supplied long-range missiles to strike Russian helicopters. It's a war that is being fought long and hard, and it's one that Tom Sufi Burge is covering for us in our prime focus tonight from Ukraine. Through a ruined and lifeless landscape, <laughs> Ukrainian forces have been locked in a bitter and bloody fight to try and drive Russia's invading army back. Artillery raining down along hundreds of miles of front line. With each Russian trench line position retaken, at a heavy cost. Combat medic Victoria preparing troops for battle, tending to a constant stream of life-changing injuries. It's a living hell, really, especially for the infantry guys and girls who are fighting in everyday in trenches. It's living hell. You lose somebody you know every single day. The US and its allies helped plan the Ukrainian counteroffensive providing intel and new weaponry, most of which was committed on Ukraine's main axis of attack in the south. But Russian mines ripped through American armored vehicles, with dense minefields injuring and trapping Ukrainian troops, making them an easy target for Russian artillery. Much of this video, published online by a Ukrainian war journalist, is too graphic to show. Taras lost his arm during an offensive operation in the south. There were seven men in his unit. He believes four of them were killed. They were badly outgunned. A lack of air support for Ukraine's ground forces has been a major problem. We filmed with this Ukrainian attack helicopter crew when the counteroffensive was beginning. Russia has many more helicopters and fighter jets, and superior types too. Against an enemy with more firepower, Ukrainian forces in fierce battles throughout the summer made minimal gains. Liberating a number of wrecked villages in the south and the east. Some of Ukraine's best units, like the 3rd Assault Brigade, fighting for months almost non stop. Well, this is a training exercise. We're moving through this tree line following Ukrainian troops. But we're right near the battle zone. These men have just come off the front lines. They've got to get this right. Storming Russian positions quickly when they go back into those fierce battles again. With Ukraine's progress stalling, Russia has this week been mounting its own fresh offensive in the east. Advancing Russian forces have taken heavy losses, according to the Ukrainian military. With winter approaching, this Ukrainian commander predicts the war will drag on. It's it's 
But for all the loss and pain in Ukraine today, belief and resolve are not in short supply. Command centers like this, linked up with mobile drone reconnaissance units on the ground, show how organized and in some ways advanced the Ukrainian military operation has become. The regiment says it needs Western technology to help beat Russian drones. The commander vowing they'll never give up. Even if our partners stop the supply of arms, we were talking about this when we were talking Ми будемо партизанити до стільки до того часу, поки живе будемо залишатися. Combat medic Victoria left her life as an investment banker in New York to serve in Ukraine's counteroffensive. Here training troops and knowing the political climate in Europe and America is changing. But still hoping the support of the US and its allies will continue. Said, I'm very, very angry to see how people react to, to you know, how slow the counteroffensive is. We are actually fighting the biggest evil of this world right now. And if we lose, the rest of the world will lose as well because Russia will not stop. Belief and resolve. Our thanks to Tom Sufi Burridge for that. Still much more to get to tonight on Prime. Coming up, my candid conversation with musician and comedian Reggie Watts on his new memoir. But next, as President Biden prepares to visit Israel, we take a look at past presidential visits to the Holy Land by the numbers. So much at stake, so much on the line. More Americans turn here than any other newscast. ABC News, World News Tonight with David Muir. America's number one most watched newscast across all of television. This is ABC News Live. The crush of families the here in Poland. At refugee centers. In Putin's Russia. On the ground in Ukraine. Close to the front line. From the capital. Destructive. Cat 4 storm. Here along I-5. Boston is in the bullseye. Let's go. ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. Anytime, anywhere. Streaming 24-7. Straight to you for free. Thank you for making ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. From America's number one news comes the all-new ABC News app. Breaking news, incredible video, faster, smarter, and customizable to your interests. If you love being in the know, you're going to love this. Experience the all-new ABC News app. Download it now. All right, here we go. You ready? Let's do it. Yes, it's the show America wants and America needs right now. This is What Would You Do? Let's go. How are you? <laughs> yes. So what will you be watching? Watching Saturdays on ABC News Live. What would you do? Hey, I guess I just found out. <laughs> the What Would You Do Marathon, 2 to 6 Eastern, every Saturday on ABC News Live. My favorite show. First thing in the morning. There's a lot going on. Everybody in that home is okay. To catch you up with what happened overnight. We are here at fashion's biggest night out. What's happening today, YouTube has unveiled a new set of policies. What people are talking about, the new ad campaign. Fast, straightforward. With some fun in between. A real life Barbie dream house. A name change for the Wienermobile. First thing in the morning. America This Morning. America's number one early morning news. On ABC News Live. Hello, hello. Sophie, what up, homie? You got any plans after this? They seem to be happy, and all of a sudden, please say it ain't so. If you don't hear it from these lips, don't believe it, okay? There are no accidents in the public eye. Taylor is sending a message, hey, she's on our side. Divorcing Jonas, Joe and Sophie. When children are involved, it becomes much more complicated. Very contentious, and then it becomes a mess. No streaming on Hulu. When I got sent to Idaho to cover the murders of four college students, it was a story that didn't make any sense. Four students stabbed to death in their beds while two roommates were home. You gotta think to yourself, okay, who's the target and how many people would a man go through to get to his target? I'm Kana Whitworth with ABC News. This is the story of savage murders, a determined small town police force and a scholar of crime. This is the King Road Killings. The full series is out now. Listen to every episode wherever you get your podcasts. It's lunchtime in America, so what are we serving up? Well, how about everything you need to know? You know, that sounds pretty good. Give it to me. Your health, your money, breaking news, pop culture, with the biggest stars, music, trends, and of course, good food. I got 
three. What you need to know. A third hour of GMA in the afternoon. So join us afternoons for everything you need to know. I love Give that. Me. Reporting from the earthquake in Turkey, I'm David Muir. Wherever the story, we'll take you there. You're streaming ABC News Live. That was President Biden taking off today for the Middle East amid the ongoing conflict between Israel and Hamas. Let's take a look at the history of past presidential visits to Israel by the numbers. The state of Israel was founded in 1948, but it wasn't until two and a half decades later that the first U.S. president actually visited the Holy Land. That happened in June of 1974 when President Richard Nixon visited Tel Aviv and Jerusalem, meeting with then Prime Minister Yitzhak Rabin and former Prime Minister Golda Meir. In 19 in 1979, President Jimmy Carter made a four-day visit to both Tel Aviv and Jerusalem, including an address to the Israeli Knesset to promote the historic peace talks between Israel and Egypt. President Bill Clinton made the most visits to Israel of any U.S. president, with four trips there during his two terms in office, including attending the funeral of Prime Minister Rabin after his assassination. Clinton's last visit in 1998 was to meet with Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu, who today remains firmly at the center of Israeli political life some 25 years later. Presidents George W. Bush and Obama each made two visits to Israel while in office, and the last presidential visit came in 2017, when former President Trump traveled to Jerusalem, including a visit to the Western Wall. And we still have much more ahead here on Prime tonight. Our interview with the family of a retired police officer who was killed in an alleged hit and run. His wife tells us how she found out something was wrong through her husband's watch. Plus, musician and comedian Red Reggie Watts opens up in his new book, Tackling Culture, Race, and Navigating His Own Identity. Hello, hello. Sophie, what up, homie? You got any plans after this? They seem to be happy, and all of a sudden... Please say it ain't so. If you don't hear it from these lips, don't believe it, okay? There are no accidents in the public eye. Taylor is sending a message, hey, she's on our side. Divorcing Jonas, Joe and Sophie. When children are involved, it becomes much more complicated. Very contentious, and then it becomes a mess. Now streaming on Hulu. First thing in the morning. There's a lot going on. Everybody in that home is okay. To catch you up with what happened overnight. We are here at fashion's biggest night out. What's happening today, YouTube has unveiled a new set of policies. What people are talking about, the new ad campaign. Fast, straightforward. With some fun in between. A real life Barbie dream house. A name change for the Wienermobile. First thing in the morning. America This Morning. America's number one early morning news. On ABC News Live. This is ABC News Live. The crush of families the here in Poland. At refugee centers. In Putin's Russia. On the ground in Ukraine. Close to the front line. From the capital. Destructive. Cat 4 storm. Here along I-5. Boston is in the bullseye. Let's go. ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. Anytime, anywhere. Streaming 24-7. Straight to you for free. Thank you for making ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. When I got sent to Idaho to cover the murders of four college students, it was a story that didn't make any sense. Four students stabbed to death in their beds while two roommates were home. You gotta think to yourself, okay, who's the target and how many people would a man go through to get to his target? I'm Kana Whitworth with ABC News. This is the story of savage murders, a determined small town police force and a scholar of crime. This is The King Road Killings. The full series is out now. Listen to every episode wherever you get your podcasts. Get ready, America, every Friday. The hottest trends, styles, and must-have. What's the right stuff to buy right now? I really love that. It's time to buy the right stuff. Yes. And save big time, too. The right stuff. Fridays on GMA. You're going to love it. It all began so beautifully. Suddenly, there was a shock. Mrs. Kennedy's dress was stained her husband's blood. She said, I want them to see what they have done to Jack. What is our country coming to? Are we a sick society? I felt extreme hostility in front of Mrs. Jacqueline and Kennedy. The greatest courage is to go about a day's work. That's a large order for a woman. <laughs> Wherever news breaks, it's so important to always remember that lives are changed. Getting you behind the stories as they happen 
ABC News Live Prime. We'll take you there. Streaming free on ABC News Live. All right, here we go. You ready? Let's do it. Yes, it's the show America wants and America needs right now. This is What Would You Do? Let's go. How are you? Can I hug you? Yes. So what will you be watching Saturdays on ABC News Live? What would you do? Hey, I guess I just found out. <laughs> the What Would You Do Marathon, 2 to 6 Eastern, every Saturday on ABC News Live. My favorite show. Welcome back. It's a video that still haunts one family and has left law enforcement officials in Las Vegas in disbelief. Tonight, we have an exclusive conversation with the mother and daughter of a retired police chief who was killed during an early morning bike ride in an alleged intentional hit and run by two teens in a stolen car who recorded the entire thing on video. ABC's Kana Whitworth has the story, and we should note that the images may be disturbing. It's hard to grieve when you have anger. Crystal Propes wears her late husband's shattered Apple Watch. Everybody says, you got to go get it fixed, but I don't know if I want to. The watch is what initially alerted her by text that something happened to her husband, Andy, in the early morning hours of August 14th, just blocks from their home. The watch detecting a fall and calling 911. Chopper was out. You could hear sirens in all different directions. Yeah. And I vividly remember her turning to me saying, that's for dad. Yeah. That's for dad. But Crystal and her daughter Taylor say they never could have imagined something so horrific. Ma'am, why do you think that he's deceased? Is he not moving at all? He has not moved at all. Nobody is providing him any assistance. Nobody is near him. Nobody is looking, talking to him, touching him, nothing. I saw everything, he's like so from funny. where the phone was, where half of his helmet was, and then where the bike was. 64-year-old Andy, a retired police chief of 35 plus years, was out for a morning bike ride when authorities allege two teenagers purposely ran him down with a stolen vehicle, killing the father of two before speeding off. Like the sheriff said, I'm here to talk to you today about a video most of you have seen by now, a cowardly act that in my 22 years of law enforcement left me personally appalled. Initially declared an accident. <laughs> Weeks went by before the shocking video of the hit and run surfaced. Laughing, them saying get his ass, all of that has haunted me ever since. The video quickly going viral. We're happy that video exists, exists because that's how it got switched over from an accident to a homicide, but we didn't want the entire world seeing it. In the video, authorities say then 17-year-old Jesus Ayala was the driver. 16-year-old Yamir Keys allegedly recorded the video in the passenger seat as they're seen side-swiping a car. Police say you hear them here laughing, then planning their attack. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Authorities say the video was brought to the attention of law enforcement by a high school student who saw it and alerted their school resource officer. I can't think of too many cases I've ever had that where you have the audio, the video of what they're thinking and doing before the murder, as they commit the murder, and after the murder. And there's there's just not many cases where you get all three of those. I'll never get to have my dad there, have that, you know, daddy-daughter dance, have him give me away or anything like that. And that hurts. It hurts that that was robbed from me, and that was robbed from my mom and my brother. As the family grieves, an outpouring of support from the community erecting this ghost bike where Andy was killed. Both teens indicted by a grand jury, charged as adults, facing murder with use of a deadly weapon. Not guilty, not guilty. The teens appearing in court last Wednesday pleading not guilty to the charges. I feel like this case is coming dangerously close to being a case that the DA is trying in the media. The driver, he's certified as an adult now. He clearly made statements to law enforcement uh, that were captured on our body worn camera, where he, he makes statements where Pretty much he already knows, like he, in his mind, I'm going to get a slap on the wrist, I'm going to be out in 30 days, and he's almost trying to um, brag to the officer that I'm going to be out in 30 days, pretty much you're wasting your time, I'm going to be out. And uh, I, I think we all know now that probably is not going to be the case. What was your reaction? He's an entitled little um, My reaction was, he doesn't, re he doesn't even know what's 
coming. Yeah. He is about to get slapped in the face real hard with reality. Authorities are now looking into accusations of previous incidents involving the teens who they say stole three cars that day and hit another cyclist for striking and killing Andy. I don't think we've, at this point in time, linked them directly to any other crime, but we are looking at them at this point in time for other incidents that took place in Las Vegas. Crystal and Taylor now with a simple message. What do you have to say to his family? You failed. As parents, you guys extremely failed. I know how hard it is to be a t parent of teenage children. It's the hardest job in the world. Going into that, if these, these parents, these families, and these individuals themselves, if they have one ounce of any humanity, take the largest sentence and be done. Do not put our families through this. What, what are you going to do to keep his memory alive? Right now, fight for justice. My dad's last and final act on his earth was, you know, putting away two thugs, something that he spent his entire, dedicating 35 plus years to doing. And his, his last act, he still is servicing the public. He's still protecting and serving. And when they need that extra bit of strength to make it through the day. She wears that because that's like having him with her. Our thanks to Kena for that. Former President Donald Trump is set to return to New York City for the civil fraud trial that could potentially threaten his business empire. The $250 million civil fraud trial alleges that President Trump inflated the value of his assets to increase his net worth, bumping his ranking on Forbes' list of the wealthiest Americans and to obtain more favorable loans, guarantee lower insurance premiums, and satisfy loan conditions tied to his net worth. The New York Attorney General alleges that number was inflated by as much as $2.2 billion. Dr. Alec Baldwin could face involuntary manslaughter charges in New Mexico related to the deadly shooting on the Rust film set. The case against Baldwin will now be presented to a grand jury. The actor was pointing a gun at cinematographer Helena Hutchins during rehearsal when it went off, killing her and wounding the director. Criminal charges against Baldwin were dismissed back in April, but prosecutors now say new evidence warrants revisiting the case. Attorneys for the actor released a statement saying it is unfortunate that a terrible tragedy has been turned into this misguided prosecution. From his Netflix stand-up special to his time as band leader for The Late Late Show with James Corden, he is perhaps the most successful entertainer to ever come out of Great Falls, Montana. Musician and comedian Reggie Watts is here to discuss his new memoir, Great Falls, Montana, Fast Times, Post-Punk Weirdos, and a Tale of Coming Home Again, where he shares his story and cites his hometown as the source for his eccentric, creative, oddball persona. <laughs> Welcome, Reggie, to the show. First off, got to just say, the cover, I mean, you just killed it between the falls, the hair, the earring, <laughs> doing all the work. Uh -huh. What made you decide, you know what, I'm going to write it down. It's time to put this in a book. Well, uh, I, there, there were, you know, people on my team who were talking, encouraging me to write a book of some sort over the last, I don't know, five or six years. And I just never really found anything that I would have, I found, I, I just didn't find a reason to, to write a book, and I'm not really a literary person necessarily, per se. But then, uh, I don't know, during the, the pandemic, uh, it seemed like an autobiography might be good, and, I, and I've been, been wanting to have some kind of a book that might have a chance of turning into a screenplay. I totally see this as, as a movie, by the way, but you, you talk about growing up in Europe, uh, you have number of languages that you can speak fluently. You move to the United States, you're at a play group, and you talk about this moment, and you say back in Europe, language had felt borderless, organic. It had possessed an energy, a flow, and I simply grabbed hold and went along for the joyride. But here in front of these 12 kids, it had become a wall, a psychic barrier. For the first time in my life, I couldn't break through. And you talk about that, that you had the language, you spoke English, but you froze. What got you beyond that barrier or wall in that moment? Um, I'd, I'd probably say uh, you know, humor had a lot to do with it. Just uh, kids laughing. Like if I could make kids laugh or, or whoever laugh, adults laugh, um, generally that, that, that helped a lot. And then that gave me more confidence because they were seemingly liking me.
It, it, you talk about the, the culture, shock, culture shock of moving from Europe to the United States, growing up biracial in the mid-'80s. What advice would, would you give to somebody who perhaps is, is searching uh, for their own identity during these very difficult times? Mm. Well, I mean, you know, you have, to, you have to find time to have fun by yourself. You know, if you can occupy time by yourself and find things that bring you happiness just on your own, that's a good start. And then, uh, and then just like, you know, have good taste in people that you want around you. Like choose people who are kind, you know, people who care about you. So Montana is one of, I think, like five states left that I haven't visited. Mm. Uh, so Great Falls in particular is kind of like a, a character in the book. What is it about Great Falls, Montana that is so significant in who you are? Well, I mean, I grew up there, and, and but what was great about it is that, you know, there was an Air Force base, so my dad was uh, retired, or yeah, retired Air Force. and. Um, the Air Force Base was great because we'd have air shows. So every year we'd get like these air shows with incredible, you know, planes landing and like you get to be up close to all these like amazing vehicles and so forth. And that, that was cool to have that. It was the 80s, so the school system was funded really, really well. So we could, you could, any instrument you wanted to play, any club you wanted to be a part of, you could be a part of it. And it was fully funded by the school system. So that enabled me to expand my interests and try different things. Um, also, it's kind of like an Amer a classic all-American town. What would you like readers to take away from from this book? Um, I mean, I, I'd like them to, to, you know, read it and go like, oh, that's interesting how this guy got to where he is. Like, mm -hmm. what a strange path, you know. Uh, or maybe not. Maybe maybe some other people have a similar path. But I think it's um, I think it encourages people to be who they are. Well, Reggie Watts, we thank you so much for this. My for pleasure. you coming on the show, which we so appreciate. Want to let our viewers know Great Falls, Montana Fast Times, Post Punk Weirdos, and A Tale of Coming Home Again is now available wherever books are sold. And that is our show for this hour. I'm Lindsay Davis. Be sure to stay tuned to ABC News Live for more context and analysis of the day's top stories. Thanks so much for streaming with us. Up in the next hour, the intense manhunt underway in Georgia after four inmates escaped from jail. Plus, the former NFL star hit by a car right after an altercation during a pickup basketball game. Wherever news breaks, it's so important to always remember that lives are changed. Getting you behind the stories as they happen. ABC News Live Prime. We'll take you there. Streaming free on ABC News Live. From America's number one news comes the all-new ABC News app. Breaking news, incredible video, faster, smarter, and customizable to your interests. If you love being in the know, you're going to love this. Experience the all-new ABC News app. Download it now. It's lunchtime in America, so what are we serving up? Well, how about everything you need to know? You know, that sounds pretty good. Give it to me. Your health, your money, breaking news, pop culture, with the biggest stars, music, trends, and of course, good food. GMA 3, what you need to know. A third hour of GMA in the afternoon. So join us, afternoons. For everything you need to know. I love Give that. It to me. This is ABC News Live. The crush of families here in Poland. At refugee centers. In Putin's Russia. On the ground in Ukraine. Close to the front line. From the capital. Destructive. Cat 4 storm. Here along I-5. Boston is in the bullseye. Let's go. ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. Anytime, anywhere. Streaming 24-7. Straight to you for free. Thank you for making ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. Hello, hello. Sophie, what up, homie? You got any plans after this? They seem to be happy, and all of a sudden... Please say it ain't so. If you don't hear it from these lips, don't believe it, OK? There are no accidents in the public eye. Taylor is sending a message, hey, she's on our side. Divorcing Jonas, Joe and Sophie. When children are involved, it becomes much more complicated. Very contentious, and then it becomes a mess. Now streaming on Hulu. 
All right, here we go. You ready? Let's do it. Yes, it's the show America wants and America needs right now. This is What Would You Do? Let's go. How are you? Thank <laughs> you. Yes. So what will you be watching Saturdays on ABC News Live? What would you do? Hey, I guess I just found out. <laughs> the What Would You Do Marathon, 2 to 6 Eastern, every Saturday on ABC News Live. My favorite show. When I got sent to Idaho to cover the murders of four college students, it was a story that didn't make any sense. Four students stabbed to death in their beds while two roommates were home. You gotta think to yourself, okay, who's the target and how many people would a man go through to get to his target? I'm Kana Whitworth with ABC News. This is the story of savage murders, a determined small town police force and a scholar of crime. This is the King Road Killings. The full series is out now. Listen to every episode wherever you get your podcasts. Reporting from Monterey Park, California, I'm Robin Roberts. Wherever, wherever the story is, we're going to take you there. You're streaming ABC News Live. Good evening, everyone. This is ABC News Live Prime. I'm Lindsay Davis. Thanks so much for streaming with us. We've got a lot of news to get to once again this evening, including the president en route to Israel as Gaza braces for a potential ground invasion as Israel's retaliatory strikes batter Gaza, allegedly destroying a major hospital and refugee school, with the U.N. now telling the world, quote, no place is safe in Gaza anymore. Plus, we go to Egypt, where some 3,000 tons of aid is waiting to be allowed into Gaza. And what we're now learning about a deadly shooting rampage in Brussels. But we begin this hour with a shocking blast at a hospital in Gaza City. Palestinian officials say hundreds are dead. Tonight, Palestinians are blaming Israel, while Israel insists it was an errant rocket fired by the, quote, Islamic Jihad. The incident, which has left at least 500 people dead, according to the Gaza Health Ministry, is already having a major diplomatic impact. President Biden is on his way to Israel tonight, but the Palestinian Authority president pulled out of the planned summit in Jordan after the blast. And late today, we got word from the White House the entire summit in Jordan will no longer take place. Thousands of Palestinians had taken shelter at the hospital on the hospital grounds, fleeing their homes in northern Gaza after Israel warned them to evacuate. What about now a looming ground invasion? After the expectation the invasion was imminent, an IDF official says they, quote, may do something different. So what comes next? And what impact will an incredibly high-stakes trip to Israel by President Biden have on the entire process? Our chief global affairs anchor Martha Raddatz leads us off from Tel Aviv. Tonight, the death toll rising in the devastating strike on a hospital in Gaza City. Palestinian officials saying at least 500 people killed in what they claim was an Israeli airstrike. Video circulating online showing the carnage, fires raging in the rubble. First responders rushing victims away. The hospital was already packed with the wounded as well as thousands of Palestinians seeking shelter from the fighting. Israel tonight adamant they were not at fault. This was the Islamic Jihad that fired a long-range rocket towards a, a long-range target. It failed and exploded, and that is what happened at the hospital. A U.S. official telling ABC it is uncertain who launched the strike, and it will take a while to determine. The catastrophic blast triggering major protests in the West Bank and neighboring Jordan just as President Biden is set to begin a high-stakes trip to Israel as a show of solidarity. After Hamas massacred more than 1,400 people in Israel, the worst terror attack in the country's history. And late today, meetings with King Abdullah of Jordan and Egypt's president postponed as well. The Secret Service says it has an immensely intricate security plan in place to protect the president in what is an active war zone. Security teams already here. Trips like this one usually done in secret, but this one out in the open. As Israel prepares for a possible ground invasion in Gaza, Biden is set to meet with Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu, urging him to consider the consequences of a massive assault and the humanitarian crisis it has already caused. With airstrikes occurring throughout the Gaza Strip, residents have no place to escape. 
Where are we supposed to go? We went to schools, they bombed schools. We went to the south, they bombed the south. More than a million Palestinians have been displaced in Gaza, and tonight, back at that devastating scene of the hospital blast, many wondering what could possibly come next. Such horrific images there. Our thanks to Martha for that. Tonight, one topic that is sure to come up on that high-stakes visit by President Biden, the hostages in Gaza. Hamas now claims to have up to 250. Are they considering releasing any? Our chief national correspondent, Matt Gutman, reports in from Tel Aviv. Tonight, as the war in Gaza intensifies, the families of the 199 hostages watching it all unfold. Increasingly fearful for their captured loved ones. Until yesterday, I didn't know if she's dead or alive. Karen Shem's daughter, Mia, disappeared at that music festival in the desert. Hamas now releasing this undated video. Mia injured, but alive. To my parents, to my brothers, she says, please get us out of here as soon as possible. I just saw my baby and I started screaming. Karen elated to see her daughter alive, but gutted by her suffering. We went through operation alone, without nobody to hold her hand, in, with terrorists around her. I mean, this is the worst nightmare every mother can have. Mia's brother, Eli, watched that video too. You know her. When you saw her eyes, what did you see? Miserable. I thought she is a very big pain. So many families watching and waiting, like the parents of 23-year-old Hirsch Goldberg Paulin. Rachel and John, originally from Chicago, telling David their son was put in the back of a pickup truck at that music festival. They showed his last two text messages saying, I love you and I'm sorry. They know he understood the pain they would experience. A week later, Rachel describing the excruciating wait. I try to go through the many... Uh, you know, texts or um, emails that we're getting. And I say, I'm going to go do my cry now. And I, I go into my room and I do my, you know, primal mother. And then I wipe my face and I say, and now I have to go fight. Israel has so far tallied 199 hostages, but there are still 300 Israelis unaccounted for after Hamas's rampage. In Tel Aviv, those families rallying outside Israel's military headquarters. These posters say, bring our Idan back, and this one says, we want answers. The Israeli military tells us its special operations units are already operating inside Gaza, looking for the missing, carrying out raids, recovering some bodies, but no living hostages. Those urban areas treacherous. Today, we saw how those very troops are training. These are elite Israeli troops who are training at this base. Some of tens of thousands who've come through here to try to practice the kind of skills they're going to need inside Gaza, where the fighting will be extremely up close, room by room, floor by floor. Back at home, those families waiting for word, clinging to hope their loved ones will still return. Clinging to hope, of course. Our thanks to Matt for that. On the Egyptian side of the border from Gaza, nearly 3,000 tons of aid is waiting to be allowed in. Matt Rivers is in Egypt tonight. And Matt, is there any movement on that key border crossing? Yeah, Lindsay, all eyes remain on that Rafah border crossing between uh, Egypt and Gaza, which remains closed at this point, despite days of various sides hoping that that border would open up at least temporarily. That still has not happened for a number of different reasons. One, Israeli airstrikes continue on the Gaza side of that border. Obviously, that makes the region that much more dangerous. The Israelis also not opening up their side of the border at the moment because they know that if they were to do so, the Egyptians would want to send aid in. The Egyptian government has consistently said that in order for them to open up their side of the border to let people who are trapped on the other side out, the prerequisite for that would be that they would be allowed to send aid into Gaza. That is not something that has happened so far. The Israelis haven't agreed to that. Therefore, for all of those reasons and more, the border crossing remains closed. What that has resulted in is a log jam of aid building up here on the Egyptian side of the border. We spoke to the CEO of the Egyptian Food Bank earlier today, 
and he told us that there are nearly 3,000 tons of various aid items waiting to cross on the Egyptian side. That's everything from blankets to medicine to non-perishable goods. That is going to continue as long as that border crossing remains closed. Now all eyes turn to this crucial series of meetings that President Biden will have between Israel and when he goes on to the next step in Jordan, where one of his stated goals will be to at least temporarily open up that border crossing, not only to let aid in, but to let foreign nationals like American citizens out. Lindsay? So many desperate to get that aid. Matt Rivers for us in Egypt tonight. Thank you. We turn now to other developing news happening here in the U.S. with an urgent manhunt underway in Georgia tonight after four inmates escaped from a jail. One of those prisoners is accused of murder. And authorities believe they had help from the outside. Here's ABC Steve Osinsami. Federal and state authorities trying to find these escaped Georgia inmates explained tonight that the men had help. Someone who pulled up to this county jail in this blue Dodge Challenger earlier in the evening. They were able to escape through a broken second floor window at 3 a.m. Monday and then squeeze through a hole that police say the getaway driver cut into a fence. We will catch them. They will come back to jail. Of the four men who were being held on various charges, one of them, 52-year-old Joey Fournier, was being held on murder and assault charges, accused of killing his ex-girlfriend in February of last year. And 37-year-old Jennifer Barnwell was waiting to be moved to federal prison, set to serve a life sentence for armed drug trafficking. Police don't think they knew each other before. This same county detention center in Macon, Georgia, has struggled with staffing and funding issues. We have a jail that is falling down on us, that is breaking down. I think there's some elements of all of that that played a role in this particular situation here. Steve Osinsami joins us now. Steve, what do we know about the staffing situation at this jail on the night these inmates broke out? Well, on a normal night, the jail says it needs 30 people to properly staff this jail. But the sheriff says that on the night of the jailbreak, he had fewer than 10 people looking over 800 in inmates. One other thing the sheriff says is that this jail is old and that these inmates broke out of the oldest part of the jail. He says the jail is 43 years old and that he needs a new one. Lindsay. All right, Steve Olson, Sami, our thanks to you. We turn now to Capitol Hill, where there is still no leader in the House after Republicans blocked conservative firebrand Jim Jordan's bid to become the next speaker, at least for now. Jordan could only afford to lose four Republicans, but he lost 20 in the final vote. Jordan is the founder of the far-right Freedom Caucus and is a staunch ally of former President Trump, defending his claims that he won the 2020 election. Here's Jordan on the House floor on January 6th, raising doubts about the election. Americans instinctively know there was something wrong with this election. 80 million Americans, 80 million of our fellow citizens, Republicans and Democrats have doubts about this election. And 60 million people, 60 million Americans think it was stolen. But Democrats say no problem, no worries, everything's fine. Rachel Scott joins us now from Capitol Hill. Rachel, Jordan's refusal to acknowledge the results of the election really seems to be having an impact in this vote. Explain what you're hearing from some Republicans. Yes, it appears this did cost him votes. So I did talk to Colorado Congressman Ken Buck today. He told me that behind closed doors, he tried to get assurances from Congressman Jim Jordan that he believed that Donald Trump lost the 2020 election. But Jordan would never admit that privately behind closed doors or even publicly. We asked him again today and he did not answer our question. And so Buck told me that for that reason, along with some others, he cannot support Congressman Jim Jordan for Speaker of the House. And he said that's not changing. So Jordan didn't have the votes today. What happens next? Can he get enough support or are we back at square one? I can tell you tonight he's going to be working the phones. He's going to be trying to meet with some of those holdouts. He's even reaching out to other Republicans to help him rally support. But the reality is the more time that passes, the more Republicans he could lose because some Republicans said that they would only support him on the very first round. So we will see how this all goes down tomorrow. The next vote is tomorrow at 11 a.m., Lindsay. Right, we'll be watching. Rachel Scott, we know you will be, too. Thanks so much. Donald Trump back in a New York courtroom today for his civil fraud trial. The former president using that appearance to lash out at the partial gag order imposed by a judge in a separate case. Here's ABC senior investigative reporter Aaron Katursky. 
Former President Trump returned to his $250 million civil fraud trial in New York, still fuming about the partial gag order issued Monday in his criminal election interference case that he's now appealing. I'm a candidate that's running for office, and I'm not allowed to speak. Judge Tanya Chutkin writing Trump's incendiary remarks about special counsel Jack Smith, potential witnesses, and others pose sufficiently grave threats to the integrity of these proceedings, and adding she cannot imagine any other criminal case in which the defendant is permitted to call the prosecutor prosecutor deranged or a thug. Today's civil proceedings were supposed to include a showdown between Trump and the case's star witness, his former attorney Michael Cohen, but Cohen postponed. Instead, Trump listened to an accountant from his company describe how the former president offered his daughter Ivanka and son-in-law Jared Kushner a Park Avenue penthouse for eight and a half million dollars. Trump valued the same apartment far higher, as much as $25 million. Just one way, New York Attorney General Letitia James says Trump inflated his net worth. Unfortunately, his entire empire was built on nothing but lies and on sinking sand. Aaron Katursky joins us now. Aaron, has Trump given any reason at all why he keeps showing up at the civil trial when he doesn't have to? He does not have to, at least until he's called as a witness probably a few weeks from now. And he really hasn't given an indication as to why he keeps coming. Those impromptu remarks he makes several times a day in the hallway seem to work politically for him. But this is also a case that threatens his real estate business. He's taking this very personally. Lindsay? All right. Aaron Katursky, our thanks to you as always. Alec Baldwin is facing new legal jeopardy in that fatal shooting on a movie set nearly two years ago. Prosecutors in New Mexico say their investigation has brought new facts to light and they plan to ask a grand jury to charge him with involuntary manslaughter. ABC's Kana Whitworth has the details. Tonight, a stunning reversal. Nearly six months after initial charges against Alec Baldwin were dropped in that fatal rush shooting, special prosecutors are seeking to recharge the actor with involuntary manslaughter. They say following months of an extensive investigation, additional facts have come to light that they believe show Mr. Baldwin has criminal culpability in the death of cinematographer Helena Hutchins and the shooting of director Joel Souza. Baldwin was rehearsing on the New Mexico movie set with a revolver in October of 2021 when he says the gun suddenly fired. So you never pulled the trigger? No, 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 no. I, I would never point a gun at anyone and pull a trigger at them, never. Prosecutors then dismissing their case against Baldwin back in April after sources say the gun was determined to be mechanically improper. But an August firearms report commissioned by the special prosecutor claims the revolver was found to function properly and says that the trigger had to be pulled for the weapon to fire. Tonight, lawyers for Baldwin saying it is unfortunate that a terrible tragedy has been turned into this misguided prosecution. Our thanks to Kena. Former NFL star Terrell Owens was hit by a car in Calabasas, California. Police say Owens was struck following an altercation during a pickup basketball game Monday night. The driver hit him in the knee with his car and then drove away. Owens was not badly hurt. Police are now investigating what happened. Still much more to get to tonight. Coming up, a comedian known for her sometimes brazen interviews sits down with me to talk about the message she hopes to convey in her new book. But first, what we're now learning about a deadly shooting rampage in Brussels. Whenever news breaks, to crush the families here in Poland. Here in Kentucky, no match for the tornado. From Monterey Park, California, on the ground in Ukraine. Reporting from Uvalde, Texas. ABC News Live is right there everywhere. From the scene of that deadly missile strike in Dnipro, Ukraine. Reporting from the earthquake in Turkey. From Charleston, South Carolina, on the 2024 campaign trail. From Kathmandu, Nepal. In Truckee, California, covering record snowfall. Traveling with the president in Mexico City. Wherever the story. Here at this airport in Tampa, it's already shut down. Reporting from the nurses on the picket line. Reporting from Jerusalem. Here at 10 Downing Street in London. Streaming live to you. Wherever the story is. Wherever the story is. Wherever the story is. We're going to take you there. You're streaming ABC News Live. ABC News Live. You're streaming ABC News Live. ABC News Live. Streaming free everywhere. America's number one streaming news.
All right, here we go. You ready? Let's do it. Yes, it's the show America wants and America needs right now. This is What Would You Do? Let's go. How are you? Can I hug you? Yes. So what will you be watching Saturdays on ABC News Live? What would you do? Hey, I guess I just found out. <laughs> the What Would You Do Marathon, 2 to 6 Eastern, every Saturday on ABC News Live. My favorite show. Reporting from the White House, I'm Terry Moran. Wherever the story is, we'll take you there. You're streaming ABC News Live. Welcome back. We're tracking several headlines around the world. Authorities in Brussels shot and killed a man. They say gunned down three Swedish soccer fans, killing two of them. They say the suspect posted a video online claiming credit for the attack. The attack happened Monday night, not far from where Belgium's men's soccer team was hosting Sweden in a European Championships qualifier. Investigators are still trying to figure out a motive. In New Delhi, police detained dozens of protesters, including students who were demonstrating against Israel's attack on Gaza demanding India give diplomatic support to Palestinians. The Indian foreign ministry has condemned the attack by Hamas militants in Israel as a terrorist attack, while reiterating its long-standing position for what it says is a, quote, independent Palestine. Ukrainian President Vladimir Zelensky has confirmed that for the first time, the country has used U.S.-supplied long-range missiles to strike a devastating blow on two Russian air bases in occupied areas of Ukraine. The attack destroyed nine Russian helicopters and other military equipment and could force Russia to move aviation even further from the front lines. And still to come, comedian and writer Z-Way talks race, pop culture, and a collection of personal essays in her new book. at stake. So much on the line. More Americans turn here than any other newscast. ABC News World News Tonight with David Muir. America's number one most watched newscast across all of television. From America's number one news comes the all new ABC News app. Breaking news, incredible video, faster, smarter, and customizable to your interests. If you love being in the know, you're gonna love this. Experience the all new ABC News app. Download it now. All right, here we go. You ready? Let's do it. Yes, it's the show America wants and America needs right now. This is What Would You Do? Let's go. How are you? Can I hug you? Yes. So what will you be watching Saturdays on ABC News Live? What would you do? Hey, I guess I just found out. <laughs> the What Would You Do Marathon, 2 to 6 Eastern, every Saturday on ABC News Live. My favorite show. You're watching America's number one streaming news. Keep streaming with ABC News Live. Comedian, writer, and actress Z-Way has made a name for herself by staring interviewees in the eye and asking, how many black friends do you have? Through her Instagram Live and former Showtime series, Z-Way gained fame for her sometimes uncomfortable and nearly satirical interviews about race, societal issues, and pop culture. Now she's releasing her debut collection of personal essays in her new book, Black Friend Essays, which takes a deep dive into her relationship with topics such as identity, body image, and code switching, offering a candid, unscripted look into her life. And joining us now is Z-Way herself. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you for having me. I'm so excited, Lindsay. So how did you make the switch, the pivot, really, from doing these interviews, asking people how many black friends they have, for example, to deciding, you know what, I'm going to actually write a book about this? Ooh, great question. I started off as a professional writer, honestly, before I did any interviews, before I really did comedy. So it was a natural transition to decide to take all these stories I had over the course of my life and put them on the page. And you write, black friends come in all shapes and sizes, yet the archetype is often a two-dimensional character meant to support the non-black protagonist's more complex humanity. Talk to me about how you really challenge and deconstruct that notion in this book. Well, I think you'll find in every essay that the black person is sort of central to the story, and you're able to expand and to see their point of view in a way that's really captivating and interesting. And I think that that's something that we don't really cover as much. And you talk about the misunderstandings about race in particular. What are, are some of those misunderstandings slash understandings that you've 
you've come to know? I think some, an understanding I've come to know is that, that it's a deeply uncomfortable conversation. And a misunderstanding is that that uncomfortable conversation will ruin our lives or kill us. I like to think that having these awkward conversations provide levity and joy and make people feel more at ease with the fact that they're not perfect, just like I'm not perfect. What have you learned by having some of these uncomfortable conversations? That I don't know everything, mm. but I'm one step closer every day. What do you learn about other people? What do I, I think I learned that other people are afraid to offend, and sometimes that can, like, prohibit really deep conversation because we all want to be polite. No one wants to have people be mad at them, but I like to open up conversation to just say whatever you're thinking, how offensive as it is, and let's just have this groundwork to work with. And, and I asked you just out of curiosity when you ask people things like, you know, do you have any black friends? Does anybody ever say no? And tell well, me about your response. Well, people have said no before, and I honestly don't think that's such a dishonest answer. Mm -hmm. I think more people say no than you'd think. And do they ever give an explanation or is there a justification? Yeah, it's where why? they live, how mm -hmm. they grew up, what they do. And I think that that's a great place to start. Now we know. What would you hope that, that readers of, of Black Friend Essays, what do they take away? That I have beautiful feet and that <laughs> my, my WikiFeet score, which I wrote about in The New Yorker, should not be a two, which is okay, but a five, which is beautiful. But ultimately, I hope that people read my book and laugh. Honestly, it's just meant to bring people joy and like get them through their day. Help people to understand what they can expect when, when they read Black Friend Essays. A bunch of pop cultural conversations that I ultimately make about myself. Mm. But what does that help them to learn about perhaps themselves? I think the, the vulnerability that I share, which was really difficult, I hate sharing anything about myself, but I had to do so. To, I had to do so to make a fully functional book. So I'm hoping that people were, are able to connect with me with the places where I'm really honest, again, about my feet score, for example. That's not something I, I share with pride, but rather to show that I'm human. Why do you often not like to share about yourself? Because you're inherently a funny person. I think a lot of times people who are in particular comedians, um, they talk a lot about themselves and their experiences, but, but you seem to feel more guarded about that. Yeah, those people are the worst. I prefer, <laughs> I prefer to listen. I think that's what makes me a really good interviewer. And so I would rather just like hear what people have to say and then re react appropriately. But in a book, you really can't hide behind 200 pages. And so I was forced to share things about myself that I probably wouldn't do under any other circumstance, but I think is to the benefit of these essays. What's next for you? World domination. Mm, that's an easy thing. <laughs> Tomorrow? Yes. <laughs> well, hand in hand. Okay. All right. We got it. All right. Z Way, thank you so much for coming on the thank show. You, really appreciate it. Want our viewers to know Black Friend Essays is now available to purchase wherever books are sold. And that is our show for tonight. I'm Lindsay Davis. ABC News Live is here for you all night with the latest news, context, and analysis. You can always find us on Hulu, Roku, the ABC News app, and of course, on abcnews.com. Have a great night. When I got sent to Idaho to cover the murders of four college students, it